We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And for the last time in 2012, may I ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. Well, I, I'm delighted to announce I'll be speaking to the Energy Minister, Fergus Ewing, who's at NIG, uh, to uh, announce that the Scottish company Global Energy is increasing its workforce by 50% uh, in the NIG Energy Park, 400 new jobs. The applications for these jobs will start today, which makes it a fantastic news for the reindustrialisation of the Cromarty and a great Christmas present for the Highlands of Scotland. Joanne Lamont. And we on this side always welcome good news in relation to the opportunities for people to work. Order. Over the last year, the First Minister has told us he had legal advice on the EU when he hadn't, that college funding was going up when he was cutting it, and that we would have a seat in the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England when he hadn't even spoken to them. Which one of these answers was the most exact ever given to any Parliament anywhere? Well, First Minister. You know, that's a, that's a bundle of laughs at Christmas, isn't it? <laughs> You know, the, the, ancient, the ancient Mayan civilization predicts the end of the world tomorrow. <laughs> Joanne Lamont comes here and predicts it every single week. <laughs> Joanne Lamont. Order. You've obviously not been attending the same First Minister's questions as I have for the last year. Because I am, of course, other an optimist, other an optimist that at some point the First Minister might actually reflect on the gap between what he says and what he does. However, I think we can all agree this has been a tough year for everyone. Money has been tight almost everywhere. Some of us might ask, what could we do with a half a million pounds? Maybe 60 nurses or 14 teachers? But in Alex Salmon's world, Half a million pounds gets you five days watching golf in Chicago. What was the First Minister's preferred foreign investment opportunity visit of the year? His half million pounds trip to the Ryder Cup or his trip to the pictures in California? First Minister. Well, they, uh, pr promoting Scotland is of uh, huge uh, importance. There were, if I remember correctly, Order. three direct jobs uh, announcements uh, as a result of the uh, Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Government mission to uh, Chicago. Uh, I know that Joanne Lamont, because she's just told us, welcomes all of these new jobs for Scotland. Uh, and I think that it's worth reflecting that something we should be cheered about at Christmas is that the Ernst & Young survey once again shows that Scotland is the top location for inward investment in these islands. Given that, given that we even exceeded London this year, uh, I think we must be doing something right in terms of promotion of Scotland uh, abroad. So perhaps uh, in that spirit of Christmas and unity, which I, I know that Joanne Lamont is aspiring to, perhaps she'll welcome, if not the success of the government, then let's welcome the success of Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Development International in bringing these valuable new jobs to Scotland. The First Minister's half million pound trip to the Ryder Cup was what brought these jobs to Scotland. And if we were concerned about bringing jobs, perhaps we wouldn't be attacking the very colleges which create the skills, the afford the opportunities for people as well. But of course, the First Minister has moved this year, and I'm not talking about his proposed flip from Butte House to St Andrews Tower. When David Cameron called for talks in the referendum, we may recall the First Minister said it was an extraordinary attempt to bully and intimidate Scotland. Then he signed the timetable and said it was an historic moment. <laughs> Can I ask the First Minister who has been his favourite visitor to Edinburgh this year? David Cameron or Rupert Murdoch coming round for a Tunnock's tea cake? Or does he now regret not getting the Dalai Lama round for a caramel wafer? <laughs> Minister. Well, I think what would be a fundamental attack on Scotland's colleges is imposing tuition fees on the 26,000 students in our colleges who currently don't pay tuition fees. I think it was unwise of, uh, of Joanne Lamont to, to cite David uh, Cameron. I've been looking at Prime Minister's uh, questions from yesterday. David Cameron to Ed Miliband. 
He attacks them for having the same old something for nothing culture that got us into this press in the first place, directly reflecting on the something for nothing speech of Joanne Lamont. One year in office as a Labour Party leader in Scotland, and she reaches the ultimate accolade. She's quoted by the Tory Prime Minister in support in the House of Commons. What a disgrace. Joanne Lamont. Of course, the First Minister's problem is that John Swinney wanted to have that debate. That is why... That's why he asked Campbell Christie to commission a report and that report said we need to deal with competing demands and the reality is the price, the price that the First Minister denied of his education choices is cuts in college places and our, and our schools with a growing gap between the rich and the poor. He knows that and perhaps in New Year he might want to confront the reality of it. However, we are, we are now in the Christmas spirit. <laughs> Order! Mr Swinney. No, it, it doesn't need to be written down because it's in my very heart. Minister, because we are, of course, reaching Christmas. And after such a historic year of success in terms of the debate, presumably the First Minister will want to hand out Christmas presents to his successful team. Perhaps a congratulatory abacus and spell checker for Mike Russell. <laughs> a, talking, a talking doll for John Swinney so he can learn what dialogue actually means. Or even a shovel for Nicola Sturgeon. So she's always shovel ready to clean up the First Minister's next bit of mess. But may I wish, oh, may I wish everyone in the chamber and everyone in the country a happy Christmas and a peaceful and more prosperous New Year. And in the First oh, Minister's case, in the First Minister's case, may I wish him as good a year next year as he's had this one. <laughs> cheerful and in the Christmas spirit when she moves away from Paul Sinclair's script and, uh, and speaks from the heart uh, and I advise much more of that over the next year but let's celebrate something else today let's celebrate the UCAS figures released showing a 1% increase in students going to Scottish universities compared to the 26,000 decline in English students going to English universities Ooh. And we consider where both the college and the university funding position in Scotland is hugely greater than it is south of the border. What part of the argument for imposing tuition fees on university students, on 26,000 college students, is actually going to increase the numbers of students going to university? Can we not look at the catastrophe south of the border and hope that all parties will maintain the commitment that they made in this chamber by a huge majority yes. to not have upfront or back-end tuition fees in Scotland. And just to check that in this, this Christmas spirit, my memory wasn't playing tricks, I consulted the Scottish Labour website this, this very day. And I would advise you to consult it quickly because it might be down by Christmas. <laughs> Here it says, a picture of Joanne Lamont. No upfront or back end tuition fees for Scotland on the website. In the web, there's pictures of Jenny Mara, there's pictures of Lewis MacDonald and Richard Baker all signing the pledge oh, against yeah, tuition yeah, fees. They, they bear a remarkable resemblance to the pledge that Nick Clegg signed before his party <laughs> nose died. So let's hope as we approach the coming year. The Joanne Lamont won't relish the fact she's cited by David Cameron in the new Tory Labour Alliance in Scotland. They shall actually return to the roots, not just of the Labour Party and the SNP, but the Scottish tradition of free education. And we can say with confidence to the students of Scotland that not just next year, but for all time, that free education will be part of the Scottish tradition and pave a future for the people of Scotland, not just for Christmas, but for all time.
Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, and may I wish you and indeed the whole chamber all the compliments of the season and ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, I reciprocate no plans, Secretary of State, near future. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister didn't appear to like the, the pantomime routine. I think it's just as well that the gallery weren't charged. So let's, let's play this one straight, shall we? Yesterday, the Finance Secretary pledged to spend £205 million of the money he received from the Chancellor's autumn statement to start what he called a building boom in Scotland. But last year, the Finance Secretary pledged to spend up to £350 million this financial year through the MPD Building Fund for Schools and Hospitals. Can I ask the First Minister how much of that will actually have been spent by the end of this financial year? Well, can I point out the non-profit distribution system is such a success uh, that it's uh, being intended uh, to be copied uh, at Westminster Pardon. by a Chancellor who now declares in his words that the PFI has been discredited. Yeah. So in the, in the spirit of Christmas, in the spirit of Christmas, can I congratulate the Conservative Party on their realisation that the private finance initiative has now been totally discredited? And I hope that their new allies in the Labour Party will soon join the consensus and seeing the sense in non-profit distribution and the nonsense in PFI. Bruce Davidson. Well, as the First Minister should know, NPD is such a success that of the £350 million pledged, according to Spice, the princely sum of £20 million will be spent. That's £330 million less than the Finance Secretary pledged and has available. And that's on top of the year before, when he pledged up to £150 million but spent nothing. Zero pounds and zero pence. So that is up to £480 million promised to build schools and hospitals and never delivered. So if yesterday's 205 million can be heralded as a building boom, securing 2,000 jobs, surely by the government's own figures, 480 million would have been a building bonanza, securing nearly 5,000 jobs. Millions of pounds promised to help the construction industry, but next to nothing is being built. That's why it's so important that yesterday's announcement is not just more seasonal spin. Scotland cannot afford to wait for these shovel-ready projects to be cynically delayed until just before the 2014 referendum. So, will the First Minister tell us what the Finance Secretary refused to confirm yesterday? In which months, in 2013, will these £205 million worth of projects start? And when will the unspent £480 million previously promised actually be released? First Minister. The years in planning of the capital spending, can I point out to uh, Ruth Davidson uh, that if the Conservative Party hadn't cut the capital budget, even under revisions, by 26%, then these funds could have been spent directly over the last two years. In terms of non-profit distribution, can I draw our attention to the most significant non-profit distribution project in Scotland, which explains, incidentally, our question, the Aberdeen peripheral route. Now, I think the Chamber will agree that it is not the responsibility of the Government that the Aberdeen peripheral route was taken through the Scottish courts right the way to the Supreme Court. Should the Government, therefore, have battled their way through to get into a position where that route can go ahead and the NPD allocated for it can go ahead in that time? Or should we, according to Ruth Davidson, have spent the money on something else and therefore not be able to go ahead with the peripheral route now? Now, I say this point seriously to, to Ruth Davidson because, you know, folk across the northeast of Scotland are celebrating that at last the shovels are in the ground in the northeast of Scotland. If we left it to Ruth Davidson, the money to build the peripheral okay. route wouldn't be there because she would have spent it on something else that she hasn't defined. And if we'd left it to the Tory party, or if they'd listened to John Swinney two years ago, then the projects that are in line for this financial year, next financial year and the year after could already have been spent in Scotland. And in terms of finance and public finance, I see that the Morning Star and the Daily Telegraph... Oh, no. All right, I'll put it the other way around. The Daily Telegraph and the Morning Star <laughs> were united in agreeing with the RMT union this week, saying that the waste in terms of the West Coast route 
and the abortive abandoned bidding process would amount to perhaps £100 million. Perhaps the Conservative Party and Ruth Davidson would like to reflect in the spirit of Christmas what that £100 million potentially wasted by Tory ministers could have done if it had been invested in the economy. And do not at any time in 2013 come across to this chamber, the party of Omni Shambles, and start talking to this government about economic confidence. We have a number of constituency questions. Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if the First Minister is aware that the company Swift Horseman Limited, a high-quality joinery provider, has gone into receivership just two days ago, resulting in 40 redundancies in the town of Dalbiti in my constituency, now coming on top of 12 redundancies at BSW Timber in the same town. This loss of 52 jobs is certainly not a welcome Christmas present to that rural community where alternative employment is far from plentiful. So can I ask the First Minister what his government will do to ensure that all available support and advice is given to the affected employees, particularly at this time of year, and also what assistance it can and will give to the receivers, <coughs> PricewaterhouseCooper, in searching for a buyer for Swift uh, Horseman's now empty premises. First Minister. Yeah, can I thank Alec Ferguson for the question. Uh, as he knows, the Swift Horseman Group uh, has uh, gone into uh, receivership, which puts at risk many jobs uh, across the UK, including 40 to 50 in his constituency, in his area of Scotland. Uh, as soon as the Partnership for Canadian Employment became aware of the situation, they have already contacted the administrators to offer support. I understand that representatives in the local PACE team are visiting the site this morning uh, to speak to individuals and identify what support will be needed. It's a very difficult position at any time of year, but particularly at this time of year. Uh, but I know that Alec Ferguson is well aware of the substantial success uh, that the PACE team have had in redeploying people in similar situations elsewhere, and every effort will be made to bring about the same success in his constituency. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, on Tuesday morning, staff at the University of Marine Biological Station, Millport, and my constituency were given the kind of early Christmas present no one wants. They were told the facility will close next year after the owners, University of London, decided not to invest in modernising the facility, despite £1.7 million already raised from other sources. This internationally renowned centre supports 40 local jobs on Cumbria, an island Highlands and Islands Enterprise already considers fragile, and if closure proceeds, specialist staff will be unable to find similar employment in Ayrshire, possibly Scotland, and will have to leave Cumbria, impacting hugely on the island economy. Can you advise as to what the Scottish Government can and will do to prevent this facility from being asset stripped of its vital research vessels and hyperbaric chamber, and whether ministers and agencies will work to develop a rescue package to ensure we retain this important educational facility? First Minister. I mean, it's a, an extremely difficult situation in what is a, a fragile uh, island economy. Uh, as the member is aware, the station is owned by the University of London. Uh, it is not actually used by any Scottish university at the present, although the Scottish Funding Council does contribute some funding. There has also been funding has been offered to the University of London from a, a variety of sources. However, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning will happily broker meetings between the University of London and other interested parties to ensure that all potential options can now be explored. Uh, the Chamber, I know, just as in the previous example we are given, are well aware uh, that what may seem in global terms uh, a relatively small number of jobs to uh, an island or a rural community can actually be massive uh, in terms of the scope and impact on the economy. That is true of the situation in the southwest of Scotland, it is true of the situation in Millport, uh, and the Member can be assured uh, that the Cabinet Secretary will explore every possible option to see what can be done to help the local community. Question number three. Sorry, uh, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the First Minister aware of the fears of staff in NHS Lothian who report tremendous pressure in beds at the ERI and Western General in what the Health Board describe as unprecedented demand? Will the First Minister ask his Health Secretary to engage with the reality of what is happening in our NHS rather than issuing complacent reinsurances? First Minister. Well, I, I don't think that uh, corresponds to, to anything that the Health Secretary has said. The, the NHS Lovian Medical Director has reassured patients there are beds available across all hospital sites, and at no point will they have or will they have to stop admitting patients to hospital. Uh, as the member will be aware, there are a number of reasons for real pressure uh, on beds at, at, the, at the present moment in terms of some of the illnesses which are widespread in the community at the present moment. Uh, but she can be sure that both government ministers and particularly the health board uh, are concentrating on this to make sure 
uh, that uh, patient care is maintained at the highest possible standard. Question number three, Willard Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues of importance to the people of Scotland. Willard Rennie. Uh, two months ago, I asked the First Minister to extend nursery education for two year olds. He said he would consider it. Now that he has had time, what decision has he reached? First Minister. Well, uh, as Willie Rennie well knows, uh, there is a, a range of uh, initiatives that have already been announced uh, in terms of the overall ambit of getting it right for, for every child. Uh, the offer of 600 uh, hours for three and four year olds, the incentives that have been offered to family centres to expand their operations uh, in across Scotland, the incentive for family nurse partnerships, which apply to, to people younger than two, uh, in terms of the real difference that can make to some of the most uh, uh, challenged families in our, our community. Uh, so there's a range of measures which are there. The group, that, the all party group indeed, which is meeting, is considering these matters. They'll come forward, as he knows, in, in legislation. Uh, but in terms of the emphasis that's been put on early years development, I don't think it can be seriously said that this government doesn't have a focus and a concentration and there are substantial and important improvements being made uh, to enhance the life chances of children of Scotland. Well, I think all members would welcome what the First Minister says about extra provision, but in England 40% of two-year-olds will be getting 15 hours a week of nursery education. The future provision for three and four-year-olds is good as well, and Professor James Heckman, who the First Minister will know is clear, he says the investment before the age of three gets the best return. So will he actually commit today, or at least give an indication today, that he is prepared to consider what is happening with the extra provision, the 40% of two-year-olds, because that could be transformational. It could help disadvantaged children get a good start in life. So can I press him again? Members from all parties agree with this, including his own. Will he take this important step today? First Minister. Can I say two things uh, in seriousness to, uh, to Willie Rennie? I mean, f firstly, uh, you know, he's aware that the 600-hour commitment is much greater than is being allocated in England for three and four years. I mean, that, that, that's true. I don't think he should disregard the importance of family centres and family nurse partnership in providing uh, the ta targeted support. The task force that is working on this is working extremely hard to bring about the best possible position uh, for young people uh, in Scotland. Uh, but you know, I could cite the whole variety of sources from English local authorities who are questioning, seriously questioning whether aspects of what is said to be an offer in England can actually be delivered, given the resource position. Well, given the resource position that they face, uh, there's a whole range of English local authority leaders and other experts who are seriously doubting that. Uh, and therefore, I think we can be confident that what has been announced in Scotland to date the 600-hour commitment for three- and four-year-olds, the expansion of family partnerships, the expansion of family nurse uh, partnerships and family centres, these things are actually going to be delivered. Uh, the all-party group which is meeting on this keeps the matter under continuing uh, review. Uh, the focus of that is going to be very important in terms of government decision-making, as is in the statutory commitment to this. That package represents a substantial enhancement of provision in Scotland and is fully in line with a shift to early support and early intervention, which is the hallmark of this government, even in times of great financial stringency, which he will remember is being imposed by a government of which... Order. Well, I know the alliance and the referendum really extended to actually not thinking we're in a period of financial stringency imposed by a Tory Liberal yeah, government yeah, in yeah, Westminster. Yeah, uh, I think that is a, a reality for this year and of next year. So, just bear in mind that the efforts that have been made in Scotland are very substantial indeed, and that sincere commitment will improve and enhance the life chances of our younger people in Scotland, including those who are most at risk. Question number four, Roderick Campbell. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding the Scottish Government's submission to the EU on minimum pricing for alcohol. First Minister. Well, there's been uh, regular contact with the UK Government on minimum pricing. The Cabinet Secretary for Health, Farrak Neil, will be meeting with the UK Government's Minister of State, UK Government's Minister of State uh, Jeremy Brown MP early in the new year to discuss the matter further. 
In framing a reply to the European Commission, we continue to engage within and out with Scotland with those who agree that minimum unit pricing should form a key part of the response to alcohol misuse. Roderick Campbell. I thank the First Minister for his answer. The UK Government has shown its willingness to support this measure and it's launched its own consultation into minimum pricing, showing that once again where Scotland leads, the rest of the UK follows. Can he give an assurance that this Government will continue to promote the public health argument in, in, on pricing based upon Article 36 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union? Well, y- yes, I can. And it is worth noting that elsewhere in Europe, the public health benefits of minimum pricing, which is now supported substantially across this chamber, are being recognised. Just last week, the Irish Government's Minister for Health, Dr James Riley, said, quote, I wish to express my full support for the Scottish proposals in minimum unit pricing of alcohol. This is an important policy measure to reduce the harmful consumption of alcohol. And in this regard, the Irish Department of Health is currently preparing proposals for similar legislation in Ireland. Uh, that is uh, obviously of importance to have that degree of international support at any time, uh, but particularly important when, as at the 1st of uh, January, uh, Ireland chairs the European Council. Question five, Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on Shelter Scotland's claim that one in four people believe that they are one paycheck away from losing their homes. First Minister. Shelter's new research highlights how unemployment puts families at greater risk of repossession, eviction and homelessness. This Government remains focused on economic growth in order to protect and create jobs and avoid families being placed in this position in the first place. I was thus pleased by the, the drop in unemployment uh, in the latest quarter in Scotland. But importantly, in terms of uh, housing and housing legislation, from the 31st of December, all those in Scotland who are assessed as unintentionally homeless by local authorities will be entitled to settled accommodation. In addition, Scotland has the strongest legislative protection anywhere across these islands for those at risk of repossession. Elaine Murray. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that reply. Uh, Many of those families will spend a period of time in temporary accommodation before being able to be housed. And Shelter have also highlighted that 5,300 homeless children will wake up in temporary housing on Christmas Day because their family has no home to call their own. What consideration will your government give to introducing national guaranteed standards for temporary accommodation for homeless families with children? Well, we give all measures serious consideration, including that one. But can can I say, I delivered the Eddie Morgan lecture uh, organised by Shelter a a few weeks ago, uh, and there was huge support uh, for the legislative improvement uh, in terms of homelessness and, of course, a a recognition uh, of the sharp fall in homelessness applications uh, since 2005-06, where they've fallen from over 60,000 uh, to over 45,000 in 2011-12. Now, that represents uh, substantial progress, uh, as does the legislative framework that gives all unintentionally homeless people uh, equal rights before the law. Uh, and so, while there are challenges still to overcome and while all good suggestions will be properly considered, uh, I think the Chamber, as shelter is, it should be proud of the legislative framework that this Parliament has put into place. Uh, and also note that as homelessness in terms of these statistics is falling uh, in Scotland, it uh, is rising elsewhere in these islands. Number six, Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you. Uh, ask the First Minister what action has been taken to minimise disruption from industrial action over the festive season. First you Minister. Know, <coughs> I think this is maybe one of these questions which seemed like a good idea on Monday. <laughs> Can I, can I thank, the, uh, thank the First Minister for, for his response. If, if a week is a long time in politics, presiding officer, the three days since I lodged this question on Monday have uh, proved a very long time in industrial relations. So, uh, will the First Minister join with me in welcoming the resolution of the industrial dispute? Uh, between ScotRail uh, and, and the RMT, and in the spirit of the season, Uh, Will he join with me in wishing uh, all travellers and those working for them in the sector a safe journey and a very happy Christmas? (laughs) Yes, I will. uh, First uh, Minister. It's it's worth reflecting them. The the RMT in Scotland dispute is settled. The RMT in cross uh, country trains is settled. The Knight in First Aberdeen uh, is settled. The BMA hospital doctors uh, is settled. Uh, The RMT in Serco 
uh, over the North Link ferries, the strike has been uh, suspended. All of that uh, is welcome news. Uh, unfortunately, I've got to report that the London tube strike, apparently, in the Boxing Day, is still going ahead, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, which is very disappointing, given that even the trams in Edinburgh were running yesterday. <laughs> But I know that just, just as the advent of Murdo Fraser's question clearly focused minds in Scotland, in advance of him asking it to come to a, a satisfactory conclusion, and I'm quite certain if he puts the same mind and advice to Boris Johnson down in London that perhaps they'll get a result there as well.